my topic today is called dealing with the giants in our lives. Confidence. Confidence. And you see in that picture what a giant may look like. And the reality is there are giants in our lives. And they show up all different times and most times unexpectedly. We're going to look at this today, but the key part is confidence. Dealing with these giants in confidence. Praise the Lord. I have a couple key scriptures that I want to read first. Here we get at the reading of God's holy word. We're looking at Numbers 13 and verse 30. And Caleb steal the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and possess it. For we are well able to overcome it. Numbers 13 and 33 says, And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. May God add a blessing to the reading of God's holy word. I have two points I want to use to bring forward. This message, it's very simple. Point one, scary giants in our lives. Point two, the way to deal with giants confidently. This is what God has given me today. Point one, scary giants in our lives. And I want to take some time in this introduction just to lay out what we're dealing with. Them. Because... This topic says dealing with the giants in our lives. And when you're not got a giant in your life, this topic don't really mean nothing to you. It's, it's, you know, you understand it in theory. But when you've got some giants going on in your life, when you've got some giant situations going on in your life, whether it's in your health, in your wealth, in your relationships, when things are going wrong, and these circumstances that you're looking at seem like giant situations happening in your life. This text today is showing you how we are supposed to deal with it. Because I'm going to assure you, sadly, you know, I'm not one of those preachers that are going to give you all this health and wealth and, and name and claim and blab it and grab it type of preaching like everything's going to be okay. I'm giving you the word of God. And the more sure word of God says that from Jesus' mouth, that every, everyone that is serious about serving him shall have persecution and shall have giants in their lives. Giant situations. Because this is how God works. God uses giants to make you a giant for him. God uses giants to get growth in your life, to propel you to the next level of where he would have you to actually be. But giants will come your way. If you're serving God, there are some giants waiting for you. I've experienced some giants in my life already. And it's helped prepare me for the realization that there are more giants coming my way. But this text says, and it's all about Dealing with these giants as they come. Because if you don't know how to deal with these giants, they will overwhelm you. You will feel like it's over. You will feel like there's no way out. Woe is me. How am I supposed to deal with this? Nothing ain't working out for me. But when you're used to dealing with giants in the strength of God's presence, you become like that young man called David at the time when he faced his, well, that wasn't his first giant, <laughs> but that giant of a man that he first faced, because David had already faced some giants. He had faced the lion. He had faced the bird. He had faced all types of stuff. But he stood there in the strength of his relationship he had with God at a man that was subhuman that made all the army of Israel quake. And he stood there confidently with rocks in his hand. 
And the scripture says he picked up five rocks because it was well known that he had four brothers. This is a man that stood in the confidence of his relationship with God because he had faced the lion. He had faced the giant of the birth and knew that God was his confidence. I want us to know and to prepare us for today, for tomorrow, for next week, next month, next year, as long as God will carry and keep us here. There are some giants waiting for you in some dark alleys. There are some giants waiting for you to discourage you, to make you question whether God is really in control. It's all right, man, it's all right. It's all right, man, everything's going all right. But when God puts you and allows you to go through a test that appears to be a giant situation, you need to know him in whom you have believed. You need to know like David that you look beyond the giant and know that God is with you. I'm going to bring up some circumstances here and some of them. Some of these circumstances are away. <laughs> That scene, they are way, way out there. And when I say way out there, they are way out there because that's the reality of the world we live in. They are way out there because that's what's going to happen in somebody's life. Some type of giant is going to show up so gruesome, so big, and so awesome that it's going to be unbelievable. I'm going to bring up some stuff. Most of the stuff you guys have heard about, it, but I'm going to remind you of some giant situations. So that when the giant situation happens in your life, you have to know that the God we serve specializes in dealing with these giants. You need to be prepared because it's coming your way in some type of a way. It's coming your way. But if you've got God in the right place, you're not going to be shaken and disturbed. You might be shaken, but you'll be firm. You'll be like that tree planted by the rivers. No matter what you face in life, if you've got God in the right place, the giants and the circumstances that's going to go real warm, I'm telling you, listen, when it's all right, it's all right. But when it goes wrong, it goes real warm. But it goes real warm. Because we have a God that is in control. He allows the giant situation to seem so overwhelming. Just so that you will look to the heels for where your help really comes from. You got to know where your help comes from. And these circumstances, these giant situations are going to push you to know. I'm saying that no matter what the giant is, you can confidently Take it on. You can confidently face it and know that I know that my Redeemer lives. I know that he holds the keys to heaven and hell. He is the conqueror. Greater is he that is in me than any of these giant situations that are coming away. I'm going to give you some way out of situations. And each one, I want you to put yourself in that place. Try to Put yourself in that place and ask yourself, seriously, how would I have managed and how would I have reacted as a child of God, as someone that knows God is real? So let's jump into this text. I'm going to give you these texts, and trust me, they're going to test how much you really trust God. This is another vow known a cunt. It's in Numbers chapter 13, and it's about when the Israelites sends 12 men, one from each tribe, to go in to check out the land. They have been through the desert. It's still very early days since they left Egypt, okay? And all to the place where they can go into the Canaan, the actual promised land, the land that God promised Abraham almost 500 years ago. Verse 1 says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Send thou man, that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel. Of every tribe of their fathers shall ye send a man, every one a ruler among them. And Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan, and said unto them, Get you up, 
this way southward and go up into the mountain and see the land, what it is, and the people that dwell therein, whether they be strong or weak, few or many. This is the layout. Look at Deuteronomy. In this Deuteronomy uh, content, I want us to understand something. It's going to go a little slightly different, talking about the same scenario, but those of us that know the text would understand that in Deuteronomy, it's after this has already happened. Deuteronomy is when Moses is at the end of his life. And in the book of Deuteronomy, it's a review of the laws, and it's three sermons that Moses gives to the children of Israel as he prepares to die, as he prepares for them to go into the promised land. In this account here, Moses is actually going back in time. Because what I read to you happened 38 years prior to what I'm going to read to you now in Deuteronomy. So what I'm reading to you now in Deuteronomy, David's going to talk about the exact same thing that I just read to you in Numbers. It's actually 38 years later. Now, the same scenario is setting up. In the last text in, <laughs> in Numbers, Moses is telling them, pick 12 guys, one from each tribe, and then go into the land and prepare to find out what this land is actually like. In Deuteronomy, what I'm going to read to you now, he's getting ready to tell them to do it again because Joshua's going to deal with it. But it's reminding them of what they've done the last time they were to this point. Okay, so let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 1, verses 21 to 28. And Moses says, Behold, the Lord thy God has set the land before thee. Go up and possess it, as the Lord of thy fathers has said unto thee, Fear not, neither be discouraged. This is so amazing. And you came near unto me, every one of you, and said, We will send men before us. And they shall search out the land and bring us word again by what way we must go up and into what cities we shall come. I just want to highlight here so that some people miss it. It wasn't God's idea to go check out the land. It wasn't a bad thing, but it wasn't God's idea. Just now what I read to you was Moses reminding them that you came to me. When I told you to get ready to go into the promised land, you came to me and said, listen, let us send men and check out the place for us. That's what Moses reminded them. You said, send men. And then go up and number said, okay, go ahead, send your men. It's not a problem. Go ahead, you send men. But you asked for it, Israelites. You asked for it. Verse 23 says, and the same pleased me well. I didn't mind that you said. And I took 12 men of you, one of each tribe. And they turned and ran out into the mountain and came into the valley of Asco and searched it out. And they took of the fruit of the land in their hands and brought it down unto us and brought us word again and said, It is a good land which the Lord our God doth give us. Notwithstanding, ye would not go up, but rebelled against the commandment of the Lord to go up. Now Moses is reminding them what the ancestors done. Verse 27 says, And you murmured, in your tents and said, because the Lord hated us, he had brought us forth out of the land of Egypt to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. Whither shall we go up? Our brethren have discouraged our hearts, saying, the people is greater and taller than we. The cities are great and walled up to heaven. And moreover, we have seen the sons of the Anakins there. They were completely devastated because they were discouraged by the report that these 12 guys brought. Look at Numbers 14, verses 1 to 4. I'm going back to what actually happened now. In Numbers 14, verses 1 to 4, it says, And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses, and against Aaron, and the whole congregation said unto him, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God that we had died in this wilderness? And wherefore have the Lord brought us unto this land to fall by the sword that our wives and our children should be a prey? Were it not better 
for us to return into Egypt? And they say one to another, let us make a captain and let us return into Egypt. Mercy. Saints, be careful of what you ask for. You may end up coming up against some real terrifying giants in your life. Without trust in God, you can't deal with these giants. You literally can't. These guys had watched the Red Sea open. They had been through the 10 plagues in Egypt, and God had bought them that far, and God had kept them. And God had told them, listen, this land's for you. Saints, you need to be careful who's speaking in your ears. Be careful of the negativity that you allow in your space because it's going to cause you to question what God's got for you. Now, right to the door to possess this promised land. And 10 of the guys that they sent have discouraged them. And that's why in Deuteronomy, Moses is reminding them as they get to that place again. 38 years ago, you was to the same place. And those people murmured against God and said, what to God that we was back being a slave? When you take your eyes over God, you will be amazed how much foolishness makes sense to you. When you see people who have turned their back on God, who refuse to believe God, they embrace all types of stuff that you know will, at one time they would have known it to be foolishness. But when the God of this world blinds your eyes, you will be amazed what makes sense to you when you no longer put your trust in God. They were talking about what? Instead of facing the giant with the help of God, let's say I'd rather go back to Egypt and be a slave. This is what fear does to you. But I'm here today to remind us that no matter what our giants are, we can deal with it. Because I'm not trying to minimize what they were coming up against. Because if you do the proper research, they had a right to be scared. Because those weren't some normal people. They were anarchists. This tax calls them giants, but the proper translation calls them Nephilim. They wasn't fully human. This is some spooky dooky stuff. They had a right to be afraid. And I say to you today that giants will come in your life. And you have a right to be afraid. But you bring that fear to God. You bring the giant situation to God. And he shows you how to get rid of this fear. Because in our flesh, we know that we're going to fear. In our flesh, we will get scared. That's why this topic says scary giants in our lives. And we don't know what scary giant can come our way. Today, all is well. Tomorrow, we can wake up to whatever type of giant that might be waiting for us. Some sickness, some pink note from our boss, some partner, a husband or wife, is going lost their mind and wants a divorce. How do we manage the giants in our lives? It starts with our relationship being right with God. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 11, verses 1 to 4. And Nahash, the Ammonite, came up and encamped against Jabesh Gilead. And all the men of Jabesh said unto Nahash, Make a covenant with us, and we will serve you. And Nahash, the Ammonite, asked them, On this condition will I make a covenant with you, that I may thrust out all your right eyes and lay it for a reproach upon all Israel. Saints, I just want to remind you, Satan loves to make a fool of you. And Satan is always looking to pluck out your right eye. Because that's one of your main fighting capabilities. And when Nahash says that to Israel, what he's saying to them is, I want to make sure you can never fight me no more. Because in a battle, the right eye is the main eye that you use in the battle. The left eye is actually covered with a shield. So it's making it very hard for them to ever be able to fight. And this is what Satan wants to do to you. So this is what Nahash says to them. And the elders of Jabesh said unto him, 
give us seven days respite that we may send messengers unto all the coast of Israel. And then if there be no man to save us, we will come out to thee. What? Then came the messengers to Uber of Saul and told the tidings in the ears of the people. And all the people lifted up their voices and wept. They are devastated at this news. They can't believe what they heard. Look at 2 Kings chapter 6. And it came to pass after this that Benadir, king of Syria, gathered all his hosts and went up and besieged Samaria. And there was a great famine in Samaria, and behold, they besieged it until an ass's head was sold for four score pieces of silver and the fourth part of a cap of dog dome for five pieces of silver. I know that don't really make sense to us today, but just know that in those days, uh, donkey's head was the least expensive part and the least appealing part to eat. Nobody really ate the head of a donkey or that dog's dong stuff. Nobody ate that. But that stuff that used to be not even eaten before is very expensive because it's a famine in the land. I'm setting this up just to show you how devastating their life's living was for them. We live in a time where everything's plenty. Put ourselves in these situations and think of how we're going to respond to it. And as the king of Israel was passing by uh, upon the wall, there cried a woman unto him, saying, Help me, my lord, O king. And he said, If the Lord do not help thee, then shall I help thee? Out of a barn floor or out of a wine press? How can I help? And the king said unto her, What aileth thee? And she answered, This woman said unto me, Give thy son that we may eat him today, and we may eat my son tomorrow. And we boiled my son, and did eat him. And I said unto her on the next day, give thy son, that we may eat him. And she had hit her son. And it came to pass when the king heard the words of the woman, that he rent his clothes, and he passed it by upon the wall. And the people looked, and behold, he had sackcloth very young upon his flesh. Then he said, God do so, and more also to me, if the head of Elijah the son of Shaphat shall stand on him this day. This is what happens when you're devastated. The king is, <laughs> is out of his mind. He knows that these are some challenging times. He knows there's a famine going on. He knows that people are suffering. But then he hears that these women are eating their children. We can't comprehend this. I'm bringing this drastic situation to let you know what a giant in your life can make you do. The giant in their lives made them eat one of their children. And when the king hears this, the king turns on the prophet. Pastor, it still happened. When everything goes wrong in the land, they want to blame the church. The king says, God help me if Elijah's head is still with him at the end of this day because he's so mad because he feels that Elijah should fix this situation. But this is what happens when giant situations, I want you to comprehend this here. I don't know what's going on in your life, but no one's to a place where we're gonna eat our children just to survive. This has happened on many occasions through history. There are many different moves that have been made about people who have been in survival situations and have ate other human beings just to survive. In this case here, we see what happens when they're facing this giant. Look at 2 Kings 20. In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. And the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, came to him and said unto him, Thus said the Lord, set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Then he turned his face to the wall and prayed unto the Lord, saying, Verse, This is what happens. When you go to the doctor and the doctor tells you that you only got X amount of days, weeks, months, or even years to live, set your house in order because there ain't nothing else we can do for you. You're going to die. 
And this was the news that Hezekiah got. This was the giant situation. Verse 3, he says, I beseech thee, O Lord, remember now how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. I want us to know he turned to God first. Times can become overwhelming. When dealing with these giants, that they can cause situations to look like they are completely out of control. How do we really deal with this? How do we honestly really deal with this type of news where y'all got incurable cancer? Y'all got a situation going on in your life that changes everything from that point on. Does this giant situation take over my life? Or do I still hold the line? Do I still stay shielded up and say, Lord, I'm walking in the strength of your presence. I don't care what the doctors say. I'm looking to you. Because I know that no matter what my situation is, God is ultimately in control. You can't say that if you don't really believe it. Because the circumstances will make you eat your children. The circumstances will make you turn to the wall. And say, Lord, what can I do to help me? I'm telling you this. Before these giant situations come to your life. Because when they do come, you need this word. You need this reminder. You need to have your five pebbles on your side. You need to know how to hold the line. When everything is negative around you. Let's look at point two. The way to deal with giants confidently confidently that's the key part i want us to highlight her i have faced some giants in my life i faced some real <laughs> spooky dookie giants in my life some because of my own foolishness and some because god has allowed me to be tested but in all things i have survived them through the mercies of god and it's because of these mercies of god i continue to fall back to him, when I face new giants, when I find myself walking through the valley of the shadow of death, I'm able to say that I fear no evil because I know that God is with me. And you need to know it individually for yourself. You can't hold on to my faith and my experience. You need to know for yourself that God is real. And I want you to know today that no matter what circumstance, what giant situation you may face, you can confidently face it and be sure. Look at Numbers 14, verses 6 to 9. Remember the text we read earlier that the 10 out of the 12 came back and said, listen, we can't take from these guys. We saw the children of the Anakims there. We saw these giants, these Nephilim. Verse 6 says, And Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, they rent their clothes. And they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights, then he will bring us into this land and give it us a land which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebound not against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bread for us. And as a Bermudian, we would say, it's a piece of cake. It's easy. The Jewish term will be, for they are bread for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. This is a classic example of the glass being half full or half empty. The 10 sees a half empty glass. The two see a half full. And it's only because of what their relationship with God. That's in, this is a piece of cake. They are bread to us. This is a piece of cake. Let's go get it. If God is with you, this is how we look at giants differently. When our confidence it's not in our flesh, it's not in our, our ability, but in our relationship with God. I know 
that my Redeemer lives. I know that God is real. So no matter what I face, no matter how things go wrong in my life, and don't walk out the way I want them to walk out, I know that God is in control. And whatever I'm going through, it's because he's leading me. My trust is in him. No matter what giants come up along the way, I can speak like Joshua and Caleb. So let's go get this stuff. This is for us. It's a beautiful land. Tan discouraged everybody. This is why you have to be careful who's in your space. You can't be around just anybody. Iron sharpens iron. Don't waste your time with people who is not going to breathe freshness and truth into your life. As a child of God, don't be unequally yoked. Nothing good can come out of it. Let's look at 1 Samuel 11, verses 6, 9, and 11. And the Spirit of God came upon Saul when he had heard those things, and his anger was kindled greatly. This is the tax where earlier I read, Nahash had said, let me pluck out your eyes. And the Israelites took seven days to go out and to ask who can help them. And the word got back to Saul. And it says that the Spirit of God came upon Saul when he heard this. This is the difference, saints. Hallelujah. This is the difference when the Spirit of God is on you. That news without God is devastating. There is this great army that's saying that the only way I'll spare your life is if you let me pluck out your eyes. And these guys were willing to do it because they had no defense. But when God is on your side, you don't fear. It causes an anger in you when you see the people of God being subject to foolishness. David was angry. He said, how can you defile the armies of God? They're not just fighting the Israelites. They're fighting the army of God. It stirs up his spirit of anger. So when he hears about this, sir, his spirit is stirred up in anger. Verse 9 says, And they said unto the ambassadors that came, Thus shall you say unto all the men of Jabesh Galilee, Tomorrow, by the time the sun be hot, you shall have help. And the messengers came and showed it to the men of Jabesh, and they were glad. And it was so on the morrow that Saul put the people in three companies, and they came into the midst of the host in the morning, watch, and slew the Ammonites until the heat of the day. And it came to pass that they which remained were scattered so that two of them were not left together. This is a man that was just anointed king. He was just anointed king. He was very humble. He ran back home as a king and was walking in his garden. But when God has a plan and a calling on your life, no matter what the giant situation is, God would allow the giant situation to propel you, to bring you to the forefront so you can be recognized for who you really are. So don't run from the giant situations in your life. Embrace them with the help of God because God will use the giant situations in your life to reveal who you are in him and what has got for you. We don't for the giant situations. We embrace them with the strength of God. Look at Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Well known. Trust in the Lord, saints, with all thine heart, and lean not to thy own understanding, and especially to any negative person. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and in the midst of this giant situation, he will direct thy paths. The only way to deal with giants in our lives is by standing on the history of who God is. Knowing who God really is and relying on him. This is what makes the difference in your life. God brought you through some problems already. Go back and rely on them when things go wrong, when the things look bad, when things ain't working out, and everybody's turning their back on you. Hold on to what you know to be true. God specializes in making and keeping his word. Making and keeping his promises. When David is facing Goliath, this giant, he refers back to a lion and a bird. That by all accounts should have killed him. But because God's got a plan for David's life. Because God's got a plan for your life. 
The giants in your life are not meant to destroy you. They're meant to make you what God would have you to be. So you can deal with these giants confidently, not in your own strength, but in your relationship with God. Look at 2 Kings 7. Remember these situations that we just talked about in point one. 2 Kings 7, verses 1 and 2, and then 17 to 20. Then Elijah said, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. Tomorrow, about this time, shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shackle, and two measures of barley for a shackle in the gate of Samaria. I want to just put this reminders over. I know most of us do know it, but for those that may not know, this is the continuation of when the king was on the wall and said, listen, <laughs> listen, he put his days up. If Elijah's head is still on him, something's wrong with me because I'm going for his head. And this word gets back to Elijah. And they come looking for Elijah. This is what happened. They come looking for you. Pastor, y'all in the kitchen cooking. And they come looking for you, complaining about how the land has turned out when they wouldn't listen to you. They would listen to Elijah. So God allows a famine to come into the land to try to get Israel back in place. And they want to blame Israel. They want to blame the prophet for what they're going through. Elijah now says, listen, by this time, I know how bad it is today. I know what the doctor has said to you today. I know how the giant in your life looks like today. Elijah says that by this time tomorrow, 24-hour turnaround goes on to give these cheap prices of what food is going to be. The total opposite. These prices that he's given are lower than what a donkey's head's being sold for. But he's telling them this prophecy of what God is going to do. Okay? So let's continue to read it. Verse 2 says, Then a Lord, this guy that was in charge, who was working for the king, on whose hand the king leaned, answered the man of God and said, Behold, if the Lord would make vendors in heaven, might this thing be? And he said, Behold, and Elijah said, Sir, you can follow it clear. And Elijah said, Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but shalt not eat thereof. Because this guy is saying that, listen, even if heaven opened up, I still couldn't see flour being sold for um, a shackle and two measures of body sold for a shackle. Then right now, it ain't no food around. Verse 17 says, And the king appointed that same Lord on whose hand he leaned to have the charge of the gate. And the people brought upon him in the gate, and he died, as the man of God has said, who spake when the king came down to him. I want us to just take a second to understand. I fast forward to verse 17. And now in verse 17, uh, it's showing you where the guy that was questioning Elijah about this blessing that was supposed to come because they're all starving. And Elijah saying, by tomorrow, it's going to be so much food that it's going to be sold at half price of what it normally would have been sold. And this guy who questions Elijah publicly and says that there's no way this could happen, Elijah says, you're going to see it, but you're never going to get to eat it. In verse 17, it happens. Those of us that know the text, they go to the camp and God has gotten rid of all of the Syrians and all that's left there is food. And now they've got plenty of food. And the Lord actually sees this food. He can't believe it. He can't believe how much food he sees. Everybody else sees the food and rushes the gate and they tamper him to death. So he saw the food, same way Elijah had prophesied, but he never got to actually touched this field. Verse 18, and it came to pass, as the man of God has spoken to the king, saying, two measures of barley for a shackle and a measure of fine flour for a shackle shall be tomorrow about this time in the gate of Samaria. And that Lord answered the man of God and said, now, behold, if the Lord should make windows in heaven, might such a thing be? And he said, behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but shalt not eat thereof. And so it fell out unto him, for the people trod upon him in the gate, and he died. All this is revealing what is actually happening to this man who did not believe 
what the prophet has said. I've given you some extraordinary circumstances. And the only reason I'm giving these extraordinary circumstances is because I want to cover every situation that might happen from the smallest giant to the most unexplainable giant situation that may come in your life. None of the giants matter. What matters is your relationship with God. Look at 2 Kings 18, and this is Hezekiah. It goes on in verses 3, it says, And he did that which, talking about Hezekiah, that he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David his father did. And he removed the high places and break the images and cut down the grooves and break in pieces the brazen suffering that Moses had made. For unto those days, the children of Israel gave burnt incense to it, and he called it Nahashten. And um, those of us who remember what is talking about her is actually talking about that um, brazen serpent. So now this is years later. The brazen serpent was carried from the wilderness. And what happens is King Hezekiah finds out that people were starting to worship it. So he took the brazen serpent and he broke it up so that people would stop worshiping this thing of brass. That's the context of it. But all this is to show you what type of person Hezekiah was. And then verse 5 says, He trusted in the Lord God of Israel, so that after him were none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor any that were before him. For he cleared to the Lord and departed not from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord commanded Moses. And those of us that know the story, Isaiah comes back and instead of Hezekiah dying, God gives him 15 more years of life. And this text is to show you that God is rewarding him for his faithfulness. It says that despite his circumstances, he trusted in God. Since I want you to know that we serve a God that finds a reason. Take this to heart. He finds a reason and he finds a way to ask you every single day, do you trust me? Every day he asks you that in some way. We might miss it, but every day he asks you, do you really trust me? And sometimes it's in much more giant type of circumstances and situations, but in the most smallest way, God asks you, do you trust me? Because the most important thing in our relationship with God is about our level of reliance and trust in God. We can say all what we want, but God wants to know what's really in our hearts. Praise the Lord. Look at Psalms 37 and 5. Text says, commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. God always keeps his word. We are challenged to be like Elijah. Take God at his word. Despite what the giant circumstances look like, trust God as his spirit moves you. It's very important that you continue to keep your trust in God. The challenges in your life are going to be here. This text is not something new, but God is putting it forward because I don't know what's coming your way. I don't know what's coming my way, but this is the text that God has given us. We need to hold to God's word. We need to trust him. Commit your way to God, and God's going to work it out. Whatever the giant situation is in your life. My last group of texts is found in for Philippians chapter 4, bound in text, verses 11 to 13. Paul says, not that I speak in respect of one, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all these through Christ, which strengthens me. Just so that we know this. Sir. He's in jail. He's in prison writing this. This is after he's been beaten. He and Silas were preaching. And they got beaten because this woman got saved. And they took him and they beat him and they threw him in the prison. But these guys, hallelujah. And that's it tells you that they was in there singing and praising and go up. They was in there. Everybody else fell asleep. Everybody else was quiet. But these guys were worshiping God, talking about 
when we all get to heaven. The whole jail shook, shook. The jailer was sleeping and all the chains fell off him. When the jailer woke up, he said, kill himself because of the responsibility of losing all those people that was locked up. And Paul said, don't kill yourself. Why does worshiping God, man? Why does serving God? And the jailer came in and fell on his knees and got saved. And his whole house got saved because of what Paul was going through. So when Paul tells you that I know that whatever situation I'm facing, I know how to be a base and I know how to bond. I know how to suffer need, but in all these, I'm content because I can do all things through Christ, which is strengthening me. So when you face the giants in your life, know that God is with you. That's where your confidence is in. That's what your confidence, that's what changes your situation. That God is in control of. These guys are in jail, praising God. The old jail getting shaken. The jailer takes them home and puts stuff, staff on the wounds. These people were praising God despite the circumstances, despite the giant situations that they were facing. Psalms 27, one to four. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemies, and my first came up upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and they fell. Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. The war should rise against me. In this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Hallelujah. Lastly, again, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, Paul, again in prison, knowing that this time, her, knowing that he's getting ready to get killed. He says, for the rich cause, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. I am not afraid. For I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Saints, let your confidence always be in knowing who God really is. You will find that you will seek to dwell in the house of God all the days of your life, no matter what comes your way. This is what happens when you're dealing with giants confidently. You're going to seek to dwell in the house of God. You're going to find yourself in the house of God. Pastor spoke today about Sister Kathy and being in church despite the giant situation she was facing. Saints, no matter what comes your way from this day forward, hold the line of truth that you know. Hold to the line of who God is. Stand on that turn. Because there will be a time where you're going to be challenged. God allows these challenges in your life to shape you and to propel you into his presence. Don't let these things that happen keep you out of the house of God. Keep you out of serving God. Keep you out of being what God would have you to be. Walk in confidence. This is the word that God has given me today for you. And I pray that you would hold to that truth. We don't know what's coming our way. We don't know what giant might be waiting for us in the shadows tomorrow. But we know that no matter what it is, in this thing I will be confident. Though an army should encamp around me, in this thing I will be confident. Because God is with me. Let's be like Joshua and Caleb. Yes, we can go and get whatever God has got for us. And we walk in that confidence. We walk in that strength every day. Praise the Lord, saints. I want to take this opportunity, as always, to give anyone that's heard the Holy Spirit calling them this day and reminding them that no matter what giants are in their lives, if you've got a smoking giant in your life, if you've got a caught up in the world giant in your life, God is saying that I can slay it. God is giving you the more sure word today. Listen to that Holy Spirit. Surrender your life to God. And let these giants that are holding you back in your life get slayed by the word of God. If this is your desire today, please repeat after me this sinner's prayer. 
Father God, I realize that I am a sinner. Lord, I repent of my sinful ways. Lord, I accept you as my Lord and Savior. Come into my heart. Cleanse me of my sinful ways. Lord, I believe that you died and that you rose again so that I can have salvation. Thank you, Lord, for saving me today. But this is what you have done, and this is the prayer you have prayed from your heart. You are saved. God has a plan for your life, and God will continue to keep you. Reach out to us by the information that will show up on screen that so that we can continue to see it in your life and to give you words of encouragement going forward. Saints, continue to renew your strength in God. Continue to take that confidence facing whatever giants may come in your life. Be assured, God is with you. God is with you every step of the way. None of this stuff that may be a surprise to us. When we walk around the corner and walk into the giant that surprises us, God was never surprised. He led you around that corner. And he will keep you in the midst of whatever giant situation you may face. May God bless you all. Thank you for this opportunity. In Jesus' name.